What's up you guys, welcome back to my channel. My name is Danielle Hallen and I am back with another true crime video. And today we are speaking about an incredibly bizarre case. It's the strange death of 20 year old Joseph Smedley back in 2015. Joseph was reported missing by his sister after he sent her an incredibly bizarre text message. And just days later, he ended up being pulled from a nearby lake with 66 pounds of rocks strapped to him. Now this case, had a lot of strange things going on, but ultimately it ended up being ruled self-inflicted. And Joseph's friends and family right off the bat believe that there was potentially something more going on here. Whether that be homicidal or accidental in nature, there are just too many things that have led to more questions instead of answers. But their concerns, unfortunately, this entire time have been shrugged off because it seems like local law enforcement just does not seem interested in transparency. Um, they have failed to provide the family any sort of evidence to corroborate how they came to the conclusion they did. Um, and recently, a privately hired forensic pathologist has actually called out the original autopsy that was done and has brought the manner of death into question. So let's go ahead, jump right into this and get into the details. Joseph Smedley was born on March 27th, 1995 and was raised in Indianapolis, Indiana, alongside his three siblings. Growing up, Joseph was a happy and lively little boy and his talents and interests were honestly never ending. He excelled in school, particularly in math and reading. His family actually loved to call him the little genius, especially when he got a pair of glasses because he just seemed to know absolutely everything way beyond his years. He also had a great sense of humor. He loved being the center of attention. And according to his sister, he was constantly playing pranks on anyone who would fall for them. But by the third grade, something happened in Joseph's life that caused quite a large shift. His parents got a divorce and According to his family, it seemed to hit Joseph particularly hard. Joseph had always been very close to his mother. So after the divorce, the decision was made that Joseph would go and live with her in St. Thomas. But for one reason or another, this just didn't seem to work out. So shortly after going, he ended up coming back to live with his father in Indiana. But this too seemed to cause a little bit of trouble. Joseph had an already difficult relationship with his father. Obviously, divorce is incredibly hard on children and I'm sure it was still heavily affecting him at this time and things were only worsened when his father ended up remarrying to a woman that by their own admission no one really got along with very well and so Joseph was just not super happy in the situation and so he seemed to just fully throw himself instead into learning. Joseph loved martial arts. He excelled in it. Um, he loved to play soccer. He loved to cook. They even got him like a chef's hat and an apron and he absolutely loved Band. In middle school, he started playing trombone and he actually ended up playing this all throughout high school. He played in numerous concerts. He had solos. So he was just a very talented individual. He had a huge skill set, but there was still more that he wanted to be a part of. And this was just how Joseph was. He loved swimming. He loved to learn about technology. His father has since gone on to joke about how he would have to like suck in his pride to go and ask Joseph to help him if his laptop crashed or something happened. And he was also a varsity wrestler by the time he was a sophomore in high school. So Joseph was just the kind of person did not ever do anything halfway. If he was determined to learn or understand something, there was absolutely no stopping him. He was headstrong. He knew what he wanted out of life and knew he'd find a way to get it done. Um, and unfortunately, it seems that by the time he was in high school, his father's rules at the time seemed to be getting in the way of his very independent personality. According to Joseph's father, he started to want to come and go as he pleased, bend some rules, and this put tension on an already struggling relationship because Joseph was like, hey, I want to go and do what I want to do. Um, I don't want anyone to hold me back. And his dad's like, look, you're still under my roof. We've still got to have rules here. And so in 2012, at the age of 16, after a rift with his father, Joseph actually emancipated himself and moved in with either a close friend or relative. I've seen it described described as both. And from this point on, Joseph and his father had minimum to no contact. Joseph did, however, maintain contact with his siblings, mainly his younger sister, Giselle, that absolutely adored him. And in 2014, he ended up being accepted into Indiana University in Bloomington. This was massive 
for Joseph. This is an absolutely stunning university. It's filled with a lot of opportunity and we all can tell already that he has the drive to get things done. And so he was so excited to start this new chapter of his life. And given the fact that he has always seemed like an independent person from even a very young age, I am sure college was just a place that he knew he was going to thrive. And he did not pick an easy major either. Joseph was attending IU for biochem and pre-pharmacy. And his first year went great. He was getting amazing grades, not like that is at all surprising. According to his siblings and friends, he really was flourishing here. He had lots of friends. He had lots of girls he was pursuing. I mean, he was like juggling everything beautifully. And by his second semester, he made a pretty big decision. Joseph decided to rush Sigma Pi and eventually he became a member. Now this leads us to a week prior to Joseph's disappearance. Joseph and his older sister Vivian had been in really close contact, tons of communication in this week prior to his disappearance because summer had just ended and Joseph had recently decided he was going to move out of the apartment he had been living in and into a house with two of his frat brothers. Not like the actual frat house, but they were going to their own house, still somewhat on the edge of campus. Vivian had co-signed on the original apartment that Joseph had lived in. And the Monday prior to his disappearance, she receives a phone call from from the apartment complex and they're like, uh, hey, we got a problem. So it turned out that when Joseph decided to move out, he obviously went to the leasing office, said, hey, I need to get out of here. I'm gonna move somewhere else. He ended up misunderstanding what was required of him in order to do this. He thought that the leasing office told him that it's okay, he could go ahead and move out and that someone would move in and take over his payments. But he didn't quite understand that it doesn't always happen immediately. And you are still required to pay prorated rent typically during that time frame. And so he just moved out, said bye, see you later, I'm moving in with my frat brothers and didn't pay his final around $700 payment that he owed. And so being the co-signer, the apartment complex reached out to Vivian and said, hey, he owes $700. We're giving you guys until Monday the 28th at noon to have this paid off. Now, Joseph very quickly reassured his sister. This was just one big misunderstanding. He's like, look, I'm going to take care of it. I've got lots of different checks that I'm waiting on this week. He took a handful of jobs over the summer. He was working at a moving company and a painting company. So he said once those checks came in that week, he would go and get the rent paid before the deadline. Joseph had always been a very responsible kid and young adult. So Vivian didn't doubt what he said, but just to make sure that he didn't get caught up and you know, the new school year starting and Greek life and all these different things, she just kept in contact with him a little closely over that following week. So this leads us to Sunday, September 27th, 2015, the day before the money was due and the day before Joseph went missing. That evening, Vivian sent a final kind reminder to Joseph saying, hey, make sure you have that money to the leasing office tomorrow by noon. And Joseph again reassured his sister saying, no problem, I've got the checks right here on my desk in front of me so I can take them first thing in the morning. So everything seemed great and on track, but the following morning, Vivian woke up to a very strange text from Joseph. And from that point on, no one ever heard from Joseph again. 4.15 a.m. Monday, September 28th, just hours after Vivian last spoke to Joseph, he ended up sending a text to her saying, quote, Viv, I love you. I'm leaving the country by not telling you why I'm keeping you safe and protected. Please don't try to contact me at this number. It won't work. I'll call you once I'm set up overseas. Thank you for everything, Viv. I love you and I'm sorry. Now, Vivian did not get this text message till a few hours later at around 8.15 a.m. And when she first read this, she immediately thought it was a joke. She even responded with, LOL, shut up, because she's like, he's just trying to freak me out, make me think that he's not going to go and pay this, because this was something Vivian was a little worried about. She was trying to purchase a house with her husband. She didn't want this to get in the way of doing that. So she's like, you know what, him being the prankster he is, he's just trying to mess with me and scare me. Plus, Joseph did not have a passport and he didn't have a whole lot of money. So how would he get himself overseas to begin with? So she kept texting him as normal and eventually called him because he was not responding to her, but his phone went straight to voicemail. So after receiving no communication back at around noon, when the money was due at the leasing office, she called the apartment complex saying, hey, I just want to make sure that my brother dropped off this money and everything is good now. But they said that Joseph had never shown up. 
up. So at this point, I believe Vivian still thought there was just something funny going on, like a prank of some sort, but she wanted to call IU Police Department, so the police department that specifically was over Indiana University, to perform a welfare check on Joseph. Now, shortly after she asked for this, IUPD ended up calling Vivian back and saying, nope, no worries, we have found him. He's actually in Monroe County Jail. And so Vivian's like, wait a minute, this, this is not like Joseph. I can't believe he's arrested. What would he even be arrested for? Totally out of character for him. And so she's like, all right, well, I'm just going to call Monroe County Jail and see what's going on. See, you know, what his charges are, if I can get him out, you know, the whole nine yards. But when she calls Monroe County Jail, they're like, mm, we don't have anyone under the name of Joseph Smedley booked here. And so she's like, okay, that's strange. Calls back IUPD. IUPD is like, no, they have it wrong. We've already called and confirmed. He's definitely there. And so this back and forth goes on for an extended period of time where everyone's saying, nope, you're wrong. Nope, they're wrong. It's just an absolute mess. And finally, IUPD ends up calling Monroe County Jail again. And they're like, oh, actually... We got it wrong. There is no one here by the name of Joseph Smedley, but there was someone booked with the same last name. So this was just all a big misunderstanding. So they were all the way back at square one and Vivian is starting to get concerned because she cannot get in contact with her brother. Um, no one really knows where he is. And after that strange text, she feels like precious time may have been wasted and Joseph really is missing. So he is formally listed as a missing person and Vivian and her husband, start to make the drive to Bloomington to figure out what exactly is going on here. Now, right away, they first stopped at Joseph's house where he lived with two of his frat brothers. And these roommates claimed that the last time they saw Joseph was the night prior, which was September 27th, around, I believe, 11 to 11.30 at night. They said that they had been at the house all night long. They watched a baseball game. They watched a movie. And then at some point late that night, they all headed outside of the house to view the blood moon, which was something that was happening that night. Everyone was super excited to see this eclipse. And I believe it lasted from 10, 11 p.m. to 11, 23 p.m. But they said that when they got outside to try to check out the blood moon, the weather was not being cooperative. There was way too much cloud coverage. They couldn't see anything. So they went inside and sometime between this 11, 11.30 time frame, they all headed off to their rooms for the night, including Joseph. His roommate said that the following morning, Monday the 28th, that they woke up and Joseph was not at the house. However, there was nothing at all unusual about this. Joseph was typically an early riser. He would get up and get out of the house before everyone. And so it wasn't until later that evening that they felt something could be potentially wrong. There was supposed to be a frat meeting that night and Joseph had not missed a single one so far, but that evening he had not shown up. They immediately went back to the house they shared with Joseph to check to see if he was in his room, see if there was something going on because my assumption is they likely had texted him or called him and he wasn't responding. But when they got there, Joseph was not there, but there was a handwritten note incredibly similar to the message that was sent to Vivian. It said, quote, I had to leave the country. Don't try to contact me via cell. It won't work. We'll contact you once set up overseas. Smedley 928. Now, his roommates didn't do anything about the note right off the bat, so it wasn't until police came later on that day that they handed the note over to them. Joseph's roommates also told Vivian and her husband that the police had already been out to the apartment, but that they were only there for a handful of minutes. It didn't seem like they were there long enough to adequately search Joseph's room. And they noticed that the only thing police took with them was Joseph's laptop. And so Vivian and her husband decided they wanted to go and check Joseph's room for them themselves. And there were a handful of strange things in his room that just were not adding up to what they believed was potentially going on at this point. So if Joseph had in fact been fleeing the country for whatever reason, which is exactly what he told both Vivian and his roommates, you would think that he would take with him any money he could get his hands on. It's not an inexpensive thing to do fleeing the country, especially when you don't have a passport. But the checks that he had just told his sister about the night before were still still sitting on the desk just as he told her they were. And so hundreds of dollars had been left behind entirely untouched. These checks had not even been signed. 
It was also obvious that he didn't take a single one of his belongings with him. All of his clothes were still there. His room looked like he had just left for a little bit. So if he was leaving the country, he was leaving the country without money, without a passport, without belongings. Um, even his phone charger was still in the room. And there were also a few things in the room that I guess didn't even belong to him. And so Vivian decides to call up IUPD and say, look, something's up here. I think you need to come back and check out his room again. There's things that you missed. So IUPD did end up coming back out to check everything over. And when they did, yet another bizarre detail was revealed, specifically by one of his roommates slash frat brothers. So this roommate pointed out that Joseph had a very important bottle of scotch. He kept it in a box in his room and anyone and everyone knew to not touch that box of scotch because Joseph said, this is something special to me and I'm not opening this until the day I get married. And I don't know how they managed to find the roommates that this bottle of scotch was missing. I don't know if it was maybe by chance or if it was somewhere you could very obviously see that it would be gone. Um, but regardless, they're like, look, it's missing. And we found another note. And sure enough, right where the bottle was supposed to be, there was a note that said, quote, Joseph Smedley will return. No one was really sure how to take this cryptic message. No one knew if Joseph for some reason wrote the note himself in third person, or if maybe someone else was speaking to him. Honestly, either way, it's just a little weird because I don't see any reason why Joseph would write this third person note to himself about taking his own bottle of liquor, or if it's maybe somehow connected to his disappearance. Um, and also those that knew him knew how important this bottle of liquor was to him and that it was not to be touched. And considering the fact that this is his apartment with two other roommates, I don't know if his roommates would touch it. Um, maybe frat guys came over and they're like, hey, we're going to throw a party. Let's take whatever liquor we can find in the house. Maybe. And they wrote that note like Joseph Smedley, I will return your liquor. Either way, no one could really figure out what this was supposed to mean. And just the notes in general felt incredibly off. The text sent to Vivian at 4.15 a.m. while relaying the same message technically was still pretty different from the handwritten note. The text message was full sentences, punctuation, grammar was great, like it looked nice, especially for a text message, full thoughts, detail in there. But the handwritten note was choppy and very sloppily written. It wasn't even written in the lines. It was like cattywampus on the page. The grammar was also very, very different. There was no punctuation and majority of it. Um, and it was also signed and dated. And Vivian said, no one calls him Smedley. Like, why would he sign it that way? But his frat brothers explained this saying that the entire fraternity called Joseph by his last name, but why would he date the note? And in my humble opinion, that's probably one of the strangest things about this entire letter that was left. Because based on what we know, he allegedly went to bed sometime between 11 and 11.30 a.m. He texted his sister at 4.15 saying he was fleeing the country, which means that likely sometime in those early morning hours, he wrote and left this note to his roommates. And I don't know about you, but I probably would not remember the date change at like two in the morning. Um, I don't know if that's just me. It could totally be, but I feel like that's not really something you're going to think about or be able to process, especially if you are in some sort of distress or you're planning on randomly fleeing the country. He'd even suggested to his sister that um, he was protecting her and keeping her safe by not telling her why he was leaving. So maybe he was fearful of something, but still that was not the only strange thing about these notes. It was pointed out by his roommates that the handwritten note appeared to potentially be written by someone that was left handed and Joseph was right-handed. And another thing interesting to note is that both of the notes found in his bedroom are both choppy, no punctuation, which again is entirely different from that text message sent to his sister. And so Vivian really started to question if, if all of these were written by two separate people. And to top it off, Joseph was really close to his little sister, Giselle. If you remember from the very beginning of the video, he has three siblings and his little sister absolutely adores him. And so Vivian couldn't help but think if Joseph wanted to flee the country, why would he text me and not his little sister? Like, if there was one person out of everyone that he would probably let know about this, it would be Giselle. And one of the last people Joseph had been texting the night before he disappeared was his sister Vivian. It seemed possible that someone could have opened up his phone, wanted to send off some red herring text message. Vivian was the last person there. 
obviously a sister, and maybe that's why it was sent to Vivian and not the younger sister. All just theories, but things that were definitely running through their minds at this point. The Bloomington Police Department took over and an investigation began. Now, the University of Indiana, unfortunately, is no stranger at all to disappearances and murders. Lauren Spear is probably one of the first ones to pop up in your mind. In that case, students were informed right away about what was going on. From what I remember, the school was essentially totally shut down, but news of Joseph's disappearance was kept very quiet. Um, no one really knew that he was missing or to look out for him or to come forward if they had information. The school, for some reason, didn't say anything. And this is where things really start to become questionable. Despite the fact that Vivian had been the one solely working with IUPD in regards to her brother's disappearance, Bloomington Police Department was not following the same course of action. They started to work with Joseph's father, which understandable, that's his father. They said, look, this is next of kin. However, his father had been estranged from him for years at this point. And so he was not familiar with Joseph's life the way that Vivian was. And Vivian had been in such close contact with him and was one of the last people that he spoke to. And so you would think that they would at least want to speak to her about what was going on and share some sort of information, but they they entirely shut her out. From my understanding at the time, Joseph's family was still not on the same page. There were not a lot of close relationships still going on. Um, people were still estranged. And Joseph's father seemed to believe something entirely different and was just kind of going with the flow with what authorities were saying. And Vivian, who had had such close contact with Joseph before his disappearance, was demanding a proper and thorough investigation and was really raising and waving all the red flags that something is going on here. So it seems like authorities did not want to have to deal with Vivian and the fact that she was very vocal about wanting her brother's case looked into. And so they just shut her out entirely. Now, from the bare minimum information that is released, you can find not many articles at all on what was happening during this initial investigation. It seems that authorities had initially spoken to a few of Joseph's professors. I believe IUPD actually spoke to them. However, they didn't speak to all of them. I don't know if Bloomington Police Department went back and questioned his professors. I have no idea if they went back and spoke to his roommates again or any of the frat brothers. There is absolutely no information out there at all about what the investigation consisted of. The only thing that I was kind of able to gather through looking at social media is that according to Vivian, the frat brothers did in fact put out a post saying that Joseph was missing. They were, I think, one of the few other than family that did actually put something out there and try to alert the university. Um, but according to Vivian, all the information that they put onto this missing persons post was incorrect. So no one was talking about his disappearance. Vivian was making repeated trips all the way to Bloomington to try to figure out what was going on, questioning people on her own. There was just no communication. It felt like a giant black hole shot in the dark where no one had any idea what was going on. And it wasn't until October 2nd that authorities finally released something in the Herald Times that gave some sort of insight into Joseph Smedley's disappearance. It announced that they had gathered Joseph's phone records and bank information. And so a bit of a timeline came into view. And I'm just giving you the entire timeline as we know it right now. So they did not release all of this information at all. Authorities are pretty much sitting on absolutely everything still. Um, but this is the timeline as we know it. Sometime earlier on September 27th, according to bank records and some investigating that Vivian has done, Joseph went with a handful of his fraternity brothers Brothers to Noodles & Co. to grab a bite to eat. Now, we know that this was at least some time before 8 p.m. I've seen some sources state that it was specifically around 1 or 2 p.m., um, but either way, he was out and about that day with frat brothers, and then later on is when he allegedly spent the evening with his two frat brother roommates, and where they watched some movies, baseball, the blood moon, and then sometime around 11, 11.30, they went to bed. Now, according to social media records of Joseph Smedley, around this time, he was messaging a handful of different girls about making plans. He had messaged a few of them asking them to come and even see the blood moon that night. So he's trying to make plans for like right then. He also had been in contact with another girl about an upcoming party. I believe that following Thursday that was going to be at the frat house. He was like, look, there'll be free alcohol. 
um, a driver, you can get to and from safely. Uh, some sources have even said that he was speaking to someone about a party that was supposed to happen that night at the frat house. Ultimately, the girls declined the invitation. And so the final messages to these girls were sent from his phone at around 11.23 p.m. So it's lining up right around the time that the blood moon would have ended and his roommate said that they all went to bed. I mean, this outgoing text at 11.23 p.m. and 4.15 a.m., there is absolutely no outgoing activity on Joseph's phone. So absolute silence until that text message to his sister. And it turned out he didn't only text his sister at 4.15 that morning, but he also sent a message in the group chat for the fraternity. And all it was was a fist emoji. Nobody knows why. Even more interesting, according to phone records, it was possible that Joseph didn't even send these text messages from his house. So he was out and about in downtown Bloomington around 7th and Walnut at 4.15 in the morning. Now, Joseph's car was not in working condition at this time. So if he had gone there, he would have either A, had to get a ride or he traveled on foot. And it's a seven minute drive and a 30 minute walk. So this is where his ping places him around the last time anyone heard from him. Now, 30 minutes later, his phone sends off another ping. It's 4.45 in the morning at this point, And he's all the way up by Griffey Lake. Griffey Lake is just north of Bloomington, north of the campus. And based on my own investigating, if you were to go from 7th and Walnut all the way up to the location at Griffey Lake where a map shows his phone pinged, it would be somewhere around an hour walk, which the math ain't math in, and we'll get to that in a little bit. But keep in mind that these locations are not exact. Typically cell towers are like, I think a three mile radius to five mile is typical. Um, so give or take a little bit. And after this, there is absolutely Absolutely nothing from Joseph's phone until 6.30 a.m., almost two hours later. And at this point, it seems that Joseph, or the phone at least, has backtracked from Griffey Lake down towards Bloomington on Old Indiana 37. But this area is not that far away from the previous tower that his phone sent a ping from. For two hours, he was for some reason kind of roaming around the same area to the west of Griffey Lake. After this ping, everything stops. Now, this particular road, Old Indiana 37, is not very populated. Um, it's about five miles away from Joseph's house, roughly. And this road mainly weaves through uh, wooded areas, there's scattered houses, there's like more populated roads that you could go on, which is interesting. Um, but these roads are essentially very empty. The authorities announced in this Herald Times article that when they found this information, they decided the first place they wanted to check was on Old Indiana 37. So they brought out scent dogs, they allegedly had multiple different agencies out there working with them. I don't know exactly what areas they combed. Again, there was very little information out there, but allegedly, there was absolutely nothing found. They also at some point decided to search the area near Griffey Lake where his phone pinged at 4.45 a.m. to see if maybe there was something there, but also they found nothing. However, just a few short hours after all these searches, after the Herald Times article was released, there was a discovery at around 6.32 p.m. October 2nd, 2015. Two fishermen were walking along Headley Road. Headley Road is on the east side of Griffey Lake, so the opposite side from where all the pings were. And a family was also kind of walking along Headley Road behind these two fishermen. And around the same time, they all look over into the lake and see something floating in the water. Now, immediately the two fishermen run towards whatever this is, and they start freaking out, screaming that it's a body. There is a body floating in the water. Now, initially the other family that had been walking behind them is like, mm, this is a college town. We're in October around Halloween. This is probably just a prank. But the closer they get, the more they realize this is not a prank at all. So they call 911 and authorities, which I want to note, it was um, the narcotics unit for some reason, shows up on scene. This was in fact the body of Joseph Smedley. His body was found 10 feet away from shore in water that was only three feet deep. He was wearing a black t-shirt, a black hoodie, sweatpants, socks, and shoes. And the rest of the information is where things get really weird. 
Around Joseph's neck was a pair of binoculars and a backpack had been strapped to him with the chest strap clipped. And inside of the backpack was 66 pounds of rocks. One of the women that was present when Joseph's remains were recovered from the lake claimed that there were very obvious bruises on the visible parts of Joseph's body. Most of his body was gray from being in the water, but there were other discolored spots that jumped out at her. Also noted that it seemed like he may have had a busted lip. So from the information that we have so far, something seems like it could potentially be off here. Now I do want to note that when his remains were recovered, authorities had completely failed to inform his family of the contents of the backpack that he was found with 66 pounds of rock strapped to him. And so it took until they managed to get the autopsy report to read for themselves the shocking information. And I don't really understand why you would keep that information to yourself. So yet again, another piece of Joseph Smedley's disappearance and now death that is being completely kept quiet and brushed under the rug. Now when it comes to what was found in their searches of the lake and Joseph's remains, obviously he had this backpack strapped to him. I believe there was an external hard drive in the backpack with the rocks, his laptop charger, and then like a few school papers. Also found his wallet in his pocket. However, his phone was still nowhere to be found. And there's a whole lot of questions regarding this because according to the witnesses that located his body, they remained on the scene for a while afterwards, just in case they were needed. They noticed that while searchers were definitely checking out the area around where Joseph's body was found, there were a whole ton of searchers and crime scene tape all the way on the opposite side of Griffey Lake. And no one is really sure what they were looking for there. Now, this may have been the area where his phone sent off a ping at 440 but we know that his phone traveled towards old Indiana 37 later on. So maybe they found the phone there. Maybe they didn't. We don't know what they were looking for, but what we do know is that authorities did at some point find his phone. However, according to what they told Vivian, they don't remember where. After a few hours of searching and recovering Joseph's body, everyone left. The following day, Joseph's family was formally notified of the findings. And one thing that his sister noted during all of this that she found a little bit strange was that when she was heading to the police department, one of his frat brothers had been sitting on the front step of the police department visibly upset. And at this point, no one but the coroner and the police department knew these were Joseph's remains. Now, could he have been upset because he assumed these remains would be Joseph's or could he possibly have known something others didn't? No one really knows, so take that as you will. And then less than 24 hours after this discovery was made, Made, it was very hastily stated that foul play was not suspected and the coroner said everything so far was consistent with drowning. Now, Joseph's family was obviously devastated. His mom was living out of the country still. His father, who had not been in contact with him for years at this point, but hoped to one day rekindle this relationship, is realizing he had totally missed this chance. His, his siblings are suffering. Vivian is confused as to how any of this could have happened. How do you go from preparing for the following day to leaving the country to being found floating in a nearby lake? And no one knew how he could have accidentally drowned or what on earth could have happened? Because according to his family, he was a very strong swimmer. And they also didn't know at this point that he had 66 pounds of rocks strapped to him because there was just such awful communication between the family and the police department. So Vivian stuck to her gut feeling that something was wrong and was not very confident in the investigation at this point. So she repeatedly reached out to law enforcement to try and assist with the investigation. Now, I don't know how successful this was just because they seem to only want to communicate with Joseph's father. Um, but Vivian said, look, I've got stuff that I can give to you because she had been doing her own investigation. Vivian had managed to get access to Joseph's Facebook page and noticed that in the days following Joseph's disappearance, that a handful of messages were sent between fraternity brothers and their group me chat. And it wasn't the conversation you would kind of expect, like what can we do to help out the family? But instead, now that Joseph is missing, they're speaking about hiding drugs, like get rid of the drugs in the house. They mentioned distancing themselves from Joseph, um, even saying he hasn't paid his dues. So technically he's not even a member 
and all the frat brothers were allegedly instructed by one of the higher ups that if they were specifically asked about Joseph by anyone to say that he was not a member of their Sigma Pi fraternity. Meanwhile, while all of this conversation is going on in the background, we're telling Vivian to her face that they were devastated about what happened and he had been a huge part in the fraternity. So it seemed like there were just some sketchy things going on here and you can see why she would feel that they may have more information that they're not handing over. Now, one thing I do want to note is that they were currently on probation for alcohol use at this fraternity. So it's very possible that they believe nothing bad happened to Joseph. Maybe they're just more worried that they're gonna get in trouble for the drugs they may have on hand. A couple of days after his remains were found, there was a two hour service that was held for Joseph at his previous high school. And it was open to the public so that anyone and everyone that knew and loved Joseph could come to pay their respects. There were rows of candles surrounding photographs of Joseph. People were able to share their memories of him. They had the most beautiful quote on the program saying, his memory is our keepsake with which we will never part. God has him in his keeping. We will have him in our hearts. So many people were hurting and mourning and Joseph unfortunately had not been the only death at the campus that week. They ended up also holding a vigil for another young woman who had died. She was a student on campus. Her boyfriend ended her life. This was just an incredibly painful time for a lot of people. There was a lot of loss, a lot of unanswered questions, a lot of confusion because so many people had absolutely no idea any of these things were happening around them on campus. As time passed, the investigation continued. There was still not much being said about what was going on and Vivian continued her own investigation into what was happening. And she ultimately ended up handing over everything that she had gathered to authorities. She had screenshots. She had recordings, notes, timelines, she even brought in handwriting samples to do a comparison of the note left behind. Joseph's family kept pushing. They wanted to know, you know, what's been found. Are there any new updates? They knew that one of the first things that had been taken from Joseph's room was his laptop. So they're like, look, is there anything on the laptop that's kind of giving you some way to go here. Like we need something. According to Vivian, Bloomington Police Department responded with, yeah, well, the laptop's actually encrypted. So if you want us to get into it, we're going to have to break it. Is that okay? And they were just in such disbelief <laughs> that that was even suggested. That could potentially be a large piece of evidence. Like you don't want to break his laptop. And also we're in 2015. It seemed odd that they didn't have anyone to get into the laptop without having to go to such bizarre extreme measures. So finally, after almost two months of absolutely no information being released, Vivian is like, you know what? We think you're hindering the investigation at this point. You're not sharing anything with us. We don't even know if you're investigating. And so in response to this on December 3rd, 2015, Bloomington Police Department met with Joseph's father to share what they had found at this point. Now, I'm unsure what exactly they shared with him, if they showed him any files, photographs, anything, but we do know that the following day of December the 4th, the coroner officially ruled Joseph's death as a self-inflicted drowning. So Vivian and a handful of people began to point out the plethora of different issues with this conclusion based on just the basic information they had at this point. And all they wanted was answers. Like, please authorities explain this. Like if you're saying what you're saying and that is true, then answer our questions and it will make sense. But unfortunately that just never happened. And foremost, there was no sign ever in his life that he struggled with his mental health or had those ideations. Everything up until 11.30 PM that night, uh, before there was silence and then the strange text was completely normal. According to family that spoke to him, the text messages to his sister, his frat brothers. I mean, he was straight up trying to make plans for that night. He was trying to make plans for a couple days ahead of time, talking to all sorts of different people through messenger. So it seemed like a very abrupt change. Now, my typical disclaimer, that doesn't always mean there wasn't a problem. You don't always see someone struggle with mental health or hear about it. They could be struggling in absolute silence. And sometimes they do still continue making plans for the future. But regardless, it just seems incredibly sudden. And when you pair that with the whole picture, it seems off. Cold Case Chronicles, who closely cover this in an eight part series, brought up a great point when it comes to this as well in terms of the notes. And if maybe these notes were just a cover up to ease the pain for those that cared about Joseph. However, if Joseph was planning to end his own life, why would he make promises that he would reach out? If he's gonna go to the links to leave notes for people that he loves, that he's fleeing the country to 
presumably shield them from the pain of what he was actually doing, he wouldn't then create more pain by giving them hope. And, but there's still way more information that just doesn't add up with this being what actually happened including his movements that night being nearly impossible to do on his own. Joseph's phone showed that he was near 7th and Walnut, or at least in that general vicinity at around 4.15 in the morning. And it's close enough to where I believe he could have technically still been at his house and it was just pinging close to that area. But regardless, somehow 30 minutes later, he is at Griffey Lake, which according to every which way I have tried to make different routes on Google Maps, even to the closest point of Griffey Lake, even to just outside of Griffey Lake, takes at bare minimum 50 minutes of walking. There is no way he could have made it this far without help, without someone giving him a ride. On top of that, all of his pings that were sent off from his phone were from the western side of the lake where the Griffey Dam is. However, his body was found all the way on the opposite side, which interestingly is only a two minute drive from the fraternity house. It's almost like a straight shot. And when it comes to the way his body was found, Vivian also had a lot of questions with that as well. Joseph was a pretty tall guy, so drowning in three feet of water would have been quite the task, especially because 66 pounds of rocks isn't going to immediately drag him to the bottom and hold him there. That's probably one of the biggest questions. Why did he have binoculars around his neck? If you go by what authorities are saying, he seemingly woke up after a few hours of sleep said, you know what? My intentions are to end my life, but first I'm going to grab my pair of binoculars and on foot take a multi-mile, incredibly fast paced trek around all of Bloomington before ultimately somehow drowning myself in three feet of water. And it's just not making sense. But what does potentially make sense is the fact that there was a blood moon that night. And if he was interested in seeing this blood moon, maybe the events of the night aren't as they're being portrayed. The only logical thing I can think of as to why he would have binoculars around his neck would be to view the blood moon, especially because he was at Griffey Lake. Where his house was, there's lots of bright lights. It's in the like just outside of the university around downtown Bloomington. If you wanted to clearly see the night sky, check out an eclipse that's happening, you're probably gonna take your binoculars and go to a very dark place, like a lake in the middle of a nature preserve. But according to his roommates, they watched the blood moon from the house and all went to bed afterwards. They went to bed like right as the blood moon ended. So why would he then take off hours later with these binoculars around his neck? These binoculars, I feel like just cannot be explained other than a potential staging, or at the very least, it throws a massive kink into the activities of that night. Uh, but despite all of these strange things and all these questions they're asking authorities to clarify, it seems that Joseph's family kept hitting a wall at every single turn. Even after the case was deemed non-criminal in nature and was closed, authorities absolutely refused to hand over majority of the information on Joseph's case. They gave the family his clothing, but they refused to give back his laptop. They refused to give back his phone, pretty much any electronics, and would not give them the case files at all. And it just sucks because where there is smoke, there is fire. And I feel like so many people want to very easily brush off families that feel this way or situations that are like this. But when you have a non-criminal case like this, there's no reason to not hand the family over everything involved in the death of their loved one. And when you're not doing that and also very unwilling to cooperate and answer questions, it makes things look shady. And when all the questions are in regards to this potentially being something other than what the case has been classified, we don't have a good mixture happening here. Vivian at one point even went down to Bloomington Police Department with the power of attorney papers to get Joseph's laptop and still they refused. So at this point, the family's like, we're pushing forward without you and we will figure this out. So they hired a third party forensic pathologist named Dr. Thomas Sozio. And he was going to perform another autopsy to just see if he came to the same conclusion as the other coroner, because it seemed again that from the get-go within 20, less than 24 hours, this coroner immediately was suggesting it was a suicide without even having everything, without there even being an investigation, like bonkers. And you guessed it, this forensic pathologist did not come to the same conclusion as the original coroner. Now, Dr. Thomas Sozio told the family that from what he was able to see, this entire thing was handled very poorly. Even down to the recovery of Joseph's body, 
it was not done well. It seems that the assumption from the get-go, as we already assumed based on everything, was that this was a self-inflicted death. Nothing was treated as if it could ever become a potential criminal case. His body had been pulled haphazardly from the lake, um, probably because it was not homicide detectives doing it, but for some reason, the narcotics unit, and he was put into a body bag and everything that was found with him that should have been placed into evidence bags you know, until they deemed it was not a homicide investigation, was instead just tossed into the body bag with him. So none of the evidence was preserved at all. On top of that, when it came to the autopsy itself, it was not thoroughly done. They did not do a lot of things that typically you would see again, if you were trying to cover all your bases for a potential homicide investigation, such as there were no fingernail scrapings. Like there were so many different things that were missed and completely left out of the original autopsy. Not only that, but Dr. Sozio found injuries on Joseph's body that had not been mentioned in the original autopsy. Joseph had pretty severe hemorrhaging on his back. Hemorrhaging is caused from some sort of trauma or blow or stab wound or just something. That's like a massive bruise. So something happened to his back. And according to Dr. Sozio, this injury is not at all consistent with what you would see with a self-inflicted death. There was something else going on here. According to Vivian, this is not even the end of that list. And when he went to finalize his report, he approached Bloomington Police Department and said, hey, I need to see the rest of the case files to be able to get the full picture of the case, which is what you do when you're a coroner, when you're a forensic pathologist. He's like, I need to see the circumstantial evidence and other details to form a better picture. And they refused to cooperate. Bloomington Police Department straight up told this forensic pathologist they were not giving him any of the case files on this already closed non-criminal case. By November of 2016, Vivian formally filed a petition to try and force all involved agencies to hand over the case files. And she had a pro bono attorney for this. Now, for one reason or another, I think it was due to family conflict because her father and herself were not on the same page still, this attorney backed out. And so Vivian ended up working with another attorney that seemed absolutely great, um, was gathering all sorts of information, going to all the hearings. For this court date, the attorney approaches Vivian and is like, you know what, I actually decided to postpone things and do another court date in the future. He was like, because I spoke to Monroe County and you know, I think they're going to give us the information we want without having to go to court. So this would be like an open time period to let them make the right decision essentially. And so Vivian's like, all right, cool. Like let's hope, let's hope so. Let's go for it. As time passes, Monroe County never comes forward with any of the case files. And the day before that hearing, all of a sudden her attorney is like, you know what? I actually have to back out and cites conflict of interest. And do you know what the conflict of interest was? This attorney was working for Monroe County. And he ends up saying, you know what, uh, I'm sorry, like here's another attorney. So she tries to go and get this other attorney to work with her because they're last minute scrambling. And this attorney won't even speak to her until she puts down a retainer. At this point, Vivian says, you know what, I'm just gonna go up against everyone on my own. And so she reaches out to the previous attorney and says, I just need all the information that you gathered, like what our case was built on, to be able to go to the courtroom myself and handle everything without an attorney. And I kid you not, this man ghosted her. Totally stopped responding once she asked for all the files of the case that he had allegedly been working on to help get her all these case files. Obviously this was all unsuccessful and they never got the case files. Now over the next couple of years, it seems that Vivian and the rest of her family got on the same page. And in 2020, there ended up being a big push of renewed hope. Now a lot of things were happening across the country in 2020 after George Floyd and many different names of victims were brought to the forefront. Joseph was one of those names that had been brought back up. So a petition was started to have Joseph's case reopened first and foremost, and also to force Bloomington Police Department to cooperate with the forensic pathologist that Vivian and her family had hired. And it was getting signatures quick. I think 
In 2022, it had reached like 120,000 signatures or something like that. And from my understanding, it is still up there for you to go and sign. But when this all started coming out, there's obviously renewed interest. Different journalists started to speak to the family again. And so Vivian ended up sharing even more information that the FBI had actually looked into Joseph's case. And they allegedly claimed that their investigation into his death did not rule out homicide. Homicide was still a possibility. Now they did say that a self-inflicted death was still possible. So how on earth did Monroe County finalize a cause and manner of death on someone without fully ruling out other options? And by December of 2021, a new PI and lawyer were hired to help the family get access to the case files. Hopefully this attorney is better than the other ones and this will ultimately be successful. I have not seen a lot of information shared about this new attorney on social media or the justice for Joseph Facebook page. Um, but what I will say is that this family just wants transparency and answers. That is literally all they have been asking for. His family has repeatedly stated that if there's clear evidence that points directly to the fact that this is self-inflicted, like unrefutable evidence to support this conclusion should be as simple as authorities sharing it. Like why would you hide it unless there was something you didn't want people to know? Um, and so in 2022, Joseph's story was aired on Still a Mystery by Investigation Discovery. And I was hoping that it would draw more attention to Joseph's case, maybe push authorities to be a little more cooperative, but I have seen absolutely no updates at all. And interestingly, in most true crime, like documentaries and series like that, especially on Investigation Discovery, law enforcement is brought in to speak on their side of things. And there was no one from Bloomington Police Department or Indiana a university police department on that episode from what I can see. So maybe it's normal for that particular show. I don't know. I just found it a little bit strange. It is never going to get easier seeing families fighting tooth and nail to get deserved answers on their loved one's death or disappearance. Um, he meant the world to a lot of people and to be treated as a file to protect, to potentially just protect someone's ego or protect someone other than the victim is unacceptable. I'm very familiar with FOIAs after what I've done for the past couple of years here on this channel. And typically in most states, there is no legal reason to not share case files, even redacted case files. Even that, there's not a current ongoing criminal investigation. Now, when it comes to theories and Joseph's death, there are obviously a few because that's really all that people have been left with. I don't think I've really seen anyone so far that seems totally on board with this idea that this is a self-inflicted death. Now, obviously that's still something to look into and it's really difficult to look into that possibility because it's not linear, it's not always obvious and it's like I've already said, there's always going to be people that are struggling that don't outwardly show it. There's going to be people that are still, you know, planning for the future, going through the motions until one moment their mind is made up. And there's not always logic in those decisions or how they choose to do things or any of that. But so far, all the information that has been gathered and even the FBI has stated that this is not the only possibility here. There are also those that theorize that Joseph was potentially targeted because of his race. There was a lot of racial tension in this area at the time. I've seen multiple interviews with people living in the area that have confirmed their own experiences with this. But if Joseph was being targeted because of his race or just targeted in general, it would have had to have been someone close to him, someone in the fraternity, someone with access to his house. There's just too much to make it seem like this was an absolute stranger or random crime of opportunity. Next theory is a very, very wild one and it is heavily circulated. And it brought to light actually a handful of things that. I had never even heard of before. And when I first heard about this theory, I'm like, this is so out of left field. Like, I don't understand how someone came up with this, how it makes sense, but hang in there with me because it actually seems kind of possible. Now there is some that speculate and even his family has spoken on the possibility that Joseph was an informant. Because if you weren't aware, which I wasn't, there is apparently a huge thing where universities catch students with drugs and then basically give them an ultimatum. You either get kicked out of school because of the drugs we found on you, or you become a criminal informant for us and your slate is wiped clean. And the way that they basically force these young adults to 
do this to protect themselves is even more sickening. They're ultimately, they have no choice but to become an informant. And from what I've seen, there were like at least 17 informants at Indiana University at the time. Like this is not even a small thing. It is everywhere. And the worst part is that there are multiple known deaths linked back to students being used as informants. With Joseph's case, they actually asked the FBI, like, is it a possibility that he was an informant and something happened to him? And they apparently came forward and said that after their investigation, they found no evidence to suggest that Joseph Smedley had ever been an informant. Even after death, they're not going to come forward and say, hey, we had someone out there doing our dirty work for us, especially when it is a young adult in college that they cornered into a situation. And so to connect all the dots together to show how this could be even more of a possibility, Joseph was apparently selling small amounts of weed to his friends like very small amounts to make a little bit of money. And not just that, being in pre-farm, he was learning how to make DMT. So there was a huge chance that he had been caught selling drugs at some point on campus. And knowing him and how dedicated he was to what he was doing, he would have been devastated had he been kicked out. So it doesn't seem that far-fetched anymore that this is what could be going on. And what is the one thing that Bloomington Police Department will not give back out of Joseph's belongings? any of his electronics. Definitely suggest you guys go and check out the Still a Mystery episode on investigation discovery. Hopefully all of the support will eventually get these files into the hands of the people that need them, which are the forensic pathologists to complete this report, as well as Joseph's family to be able to understand what is actually happening here. Let me know what you guys think down below and make sure to take the time to go and show some love and support to Joseph's family. Vivian's dedication to her brother and getting to the truth, as well as just speaking out about the realities of things and demanding answers when other people want her to stay quiet is incredibly admirable. It's been years now of her kind of taking the brunt of everything. So just make sure she knows that she is supported along with the rest of Joseph's family. With that being said, make sure you remain respectful, kind, and thoughtful in the comments down below. Below. All of my sources, as always, are linked in the description box down below. You can also check out the Justice for Joseph Facebook page. Keep updated with what's going on. On that note, you guys, I'm going to go ahead and go. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to listen to Joseph's story. Make sure to share his story as far and wide as possible. If you haven't already, hit the subscribe button down below to become a part of the Helen fam so that we can hopefully bring them home together or bring them justice together. And I will see you guys in my next video. Bye.